Consider Cannabis is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnoses, or treatment recommendations. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. I was really hoping that cannabis and cancer would be the story of 2020, that this was going to be the year we could really talk about medical cannabis. It's time to consider cannabis. I'm your host, Curtis. This is the 38th episode of Consider Cannabis, and today's guest, Michelle Kindle, recently made a short film documenting her use of cannabis as a treatment for her terminal ovarian cancer. She, like so many others, has found that this plant has great benefit when fighting cancer, which makes me ask, how long will her story and the stories of others like hers be ignored and brushed off as anecdotal? Michelle has been keeping her tumor markers in check with cannabis. You can see her and watch her story at schedule1movie.com. You should definitely check that out after this episode. But first, let's sit down with Michelle Kindle and we'll consider cannabis together. Michelle, thank you for joining us. When was your first experience with cannabis? Curtis, thank you for inviting me to share my story. My first experience with cannabis was in my mid-40s after my diagnosis with terminal cancer. I was spending the Christmas holiday with my parents. We had been evacuated from our home in California due to the mudslides and wildfires two winters ago. And we came to my parents' home because I was severely immunocompromised and staying in a hotel was a little bit difficult. So we ended up spending time here and my mom had been taking cannabis for two years before that visit since my diagnosis. She was really traumatized by learning that her daughter was probably going to die before her 50th birthday and began taking cannabis to sleep at the suggestion of a neighbor here in Colorado. She just said, Michelle, here, you had a long drive. Would you like to try some cannabis to sleep? I I did. And That piqued my interest and slowly I began this journey where now I'm taking cannabis to treat and manage my terminal cancer. Wow. So no experience in childhood. Obviously you were in California, so cannabis was around at some level in the environment you grew up in. So what was the outlook on cannabis in the household? We just have a pretty straight laced family. I never thought about it. I never saw it. I I went all through high school and college without ever knowingly seeing cannabis, if you can believe it. So it was really just a non-issue. Um, my, my parents, my, my father had admitted to smoking it once or twice and I'm, I don't know if my mom had or not, but it just wasn't, it wasn't a big thing. I was just a straight laced kid and I never had these big, you know, don't do drug talks. Cause I just was so not interested. I was a nature kid and hiking. And so it just, it was one, I was an easy parenting lesson for my parents. We just did, didn't come up. And even in college, I could have cared less if I'd seen it. So well, that's interesting. You said you were a nature kid, outdoor kid. I guess, what were you studying? What did you, what were your interests? What, what? Biology, for sure, and conservation. I'm really worried about the future of our planet. So always, since a very young child, um, biology and conservation issues. So I studied biology in high school and worked for the Nature Conservancy and was always interested in those kinds of, of issues, um, conservation management, things like that. Very sciencey. Just looking at it from like the 10,000 foot view, just seeing this little girl growing up, loving nature, loving the outdoors, and then growing up to put that passion into a profession is pretty cool. Yeah, I'm lucky. I'm lucky that I have a good solid core of something that I believe in. And sort of to contrast this experience with my um, my stepfather, who's a urologist and a physician, and he's very data driven and doctors are conservative in the sense that do no harm and be cautious. So my parents, of of course, are on board. I have a terminal diagnosis. There are no treatment options left for me. And they're both very supportive. But my dad is still cautious just because the data is not in yet. And I agree with him. I'm in a bad pickle and I'm 10 years ahead of the science, but he knows it's doing something. I mean, at this point, he he certainly believes me and believes the science, but he's still very cautious because we're really in unknown territory, unfortunately. How did he respond to your mom taking cannabis for sleeping? Um, I don't think he was against it, but he's still just very, he just wants to see peer-reviewed studies and there just aren't any on people yet. So 
the thousands of people who take cannabis for different health issues, you know, we have a good sense of all of that collective anecdotal data and what that means. But when you're trained as a physician, you just want, you know, double blind peer review studies and, and unfortunately right, schedule right. one and the classification of cannabis makes that impossible. And so that's really um, my, my mission and my passion now to save my life, but also to, to get this beautiful, amazing plant that has so much potential for so many different types of health issues to get it out of schedule one. So we can just do the science that proves that it works. You know, all the people who are saying, wow, it helps me sleep. My MS is better. My PTSD is better. My cancer tumor markers shrink. You know, I trust those people now because I know what happened to me and I believe them. What year did you, were you diagnosed? I'm in my fifth year of fighting this cancer. And for the first, you know, two and a half years, my treatment was very typical and common. There are not a lot of options in ovarian cancer treatment. So I had major surgery, 54 staples, my sternum done to my pelvis, 10 days in hospital, uh, then a few weeks to recover, and then the typical chemo couplet of carbo, platin, and taxol, which is the standard for ovarian cancer that is spread. I had um, six cycles of that and then a year-long remission, which is typical, and then it comes back. And typically, ovarian cancer is very hard to catch in time before it's metastatic. I've had more chemo, and unfortunately, I didn't really find the cannabis until sort of late in this process. So what's it look like for you right now? Do you still consider you a terminal cancer patient? And Yeah, I mean, my oncologist, I mean, I don't believe it now. I have hope mm. that I, I might be able to to keep this in remission. But mm-hmm. yes, any any actuary table, any oncologist that looked at my history would say, I mean, that I have a year to live. I've had, a, I'm at reaching my lifetime limits for chemo. So I would be eligible for a little bit more as a palliative. You know, all of this is just to give me more time. So if the tumor starts growing back, I could have another series of chemo to knock it back a bit. But there's no known compounds in the US pharmacopoeia that can save me. Um, and any oncologist would say that. So that sounds pretty bleak, but I do appreciate your spirit of feeling like there's hope in this medicine to help keep you in remission. I mean, we all pass on. <laughs> it, it's going to happen, but you know, we try to delay that as much as possible. And I do believe that you're right, that this medicine can do that. There's been research that shows certain strains do kill cancer cells just makes them turn on themselves and just die. We mentioned your movie yet. When did you decide to document this process? We went to the Galapagos a year and a half ago now for our uh, winter holiday, which was on my life goal, sort of as a biologist. That's like this pilgrimage to uh, especially evolutionary biology, which is really what explains all of the beautiful life on our planet. And Um, I was off the medicine that I had been given by my neighbor, just a very, very low dose chocolate. And I had taken those over the course of the fall and my tumor marker was going up just like one point every three weeks when I had my blood work. Then when we went to the Galapagos, I was off all meds because of course this is a federally illegal substance. It's banned almost all over the world, very few exceptions. So I couldn't take my medicine and I knew it was a risk. So we had a lovely time in the Galapagos. And when we came back, my tumor marker shot up eight points after being very stable um, and having pretty consistent growth. And when that first happened, my oncologist was shocked and I was shocked. But then after about an hour of feeling devastated, I was like, wait a minute, you know, this means that the cannabis is driving. It's in charge of the tumor right now. And so I dove in to the literature, not just, you know, the the rumors on Facebook and the internet, but I got into PubMed. I'm not afraid to dive into the peer-reviewed literature and it's tough. We are talking about the most complicated chemistry on top of our immune system and cancer. So, you know, I don't have any advanced degrees. This has all been self-taught, but the science is there. And so I... I started in on different formulas and the neighbor who had made the chocolates for me got me in touch with local growers 
I'm very fortunate that I don't live in Ohio where access is harder. We actually have a lovely cannabis industry in Santa Barbara County. The growers helped me get oil um, and tested everything. I got the full compliance spectrum. I knew what was in there. I met with several physicians online and started in on the higher dose THC oil. And I saw my tumor marker fall 50% in five weeks on no other treatment. Can I ask what that looked like for you? Like when you started implementing that high dose? Yeah. I would assume you didn't just go all out and start super high. Right. I had been on the 10 milligrams to sleep for those few months. So I ramped up from there and I ended up for about five weeks on 80 milligrams of THC a day, which is a lot. It's not easy. I never felt bad. I just felt very zonked out. And it would be something that would be difficult to do if you were working, you were in charge of children full time. You definitely need some support. But if you compare it to what chemo does to you, it's just hard in a different way. So I never felt nervous or scared or paranoid or not like myself. I just felt very tired and sleepy and sometimes a little goofy. Uh, occasionally mm-hmm. I would have lovely half hours of just giggles that everyone who's dying, everyone should experience the kind of joy in these little brief periods that I had um, when the mixture got just right. right. And I would, I would have lovely giggles. And, and you know, it was, it's great to have that when you really um, have so much stress in your life. You know, I don't know why that's a bad thing. It's not. <laughs> yeah. It's really not. Yeah. So after five weeks of that and getting my blood work back, I thought, holy cow, this, the crazy corners of the internet are real. This can work and I need to figure this out. And I ran into a friend who I hadn't seen in quite some time who happens to make short nature films. And I saw him at the coffee shop and I said, Michael, you're just not going to believe what's happening to me. And I went down to visit him on his boat. He lives on a boat in the harbor in Santa Barbara. And it just, it just happened. It, we hadn't decided to make a film. I was just going down to have a coffee and catch up. And I thought, my God, I need to share this story. I felt like my case was particularly compelling. The fact that I'd never had cannabis before, that I wasn't sort of a cannabis activist before I felt added to the weight of the story. The fact that my husband's a dean of a science graduate program, my dad is a physician, you know, my parents look like they walked out of a Republican National Committee fundraising brochure, and then the details of my disease, that I have no treatment options left, and that I'm on target to die before I'm 50. And I just felt like this story is so compelling, and Michael's like, let's make a film, or I think I said it first. But because it popped up so quickly, he said, let's think about it, right? This is a big ordeal and this is personal for you, Michelle. So let's not decide right away. He was leaving to do another short, maybe week or two of filming. We talked about it again when he got back and we got a budget together. And I said, how much will this cost? I'll fundraise for it. And so we just, we filmed the morning of surgery. So after about three weeks of thinking it over, then I'd had surgery already scheduled before my tumor marker had started falling because it had been very slowly creeping up and we had sort of had the surgery on the books. So we started filming that morning and I felt a moral obligation to share my story. The science is very clear and the conversation is so stuck. And I, of course, I want to save my life, but I just felt like I have to help break these stereotypes down. We have been lied to. And at one point, I mean, it's to the point where it's unexcusable, absolutely unexcusable. This is medicine. The science is there. And we have this systematic problem in the United States that doctors aren't taught about the endocannabinoid system and the DEA and the FDA have sort of blackballed the science and we're going to be behind the rest of the world. And it's terrible to think that you're going to have to have people with cancer and MS and epilepsy leaving the country to say, look, Canada has treatments that aren't available for me here. Israel has treatments. Europe has treatments that aren't available. And we're on target to do that. We're going to be so behind. We really are. I mean, sitting here in Ohio, just waiting, wishing, hoping that maybe they'll add autism to the qualifying conditions for my kid Mm. is so frustrating. It makes me want to sell and just move somewhere I can get him help. Yeah, and that's terrible, unexcusable. I mean, Bruce and I have talked about moving to Canada because the research there is legal and if they start a trial that might help me, thankfully that wouldn't be too difficult for us. He's 
a professor and we have sabbatical credits. But all these children that had to move to Colorado, I mean, it's unexcusable, unexcusable. Yeah. In the movie, you were stuffing letters saying you were going to be petitioning the DEA. Were you stuffing those letters to send to attorney's offices or were you actually sending those letters to the DEA? We did. We wrote little notes and we sent them to the DEA and told them what I was doing. Did you ever hear back from them at all? No, of course not. No. Yeah. But um, I've also written to attorneys and trying to find the right law firm to sue, not necessarily to get a judgment in my favor because the laws are written. They've you know created this box that it's a sort of impossible to climb out of. The science is illegal and you, you can't prove, you know, the, the, the DEA has made it so that they're not breaking any rules, right? They've created the structure that we're fighting against. So it's tricky. But I, it's really about the publicity, right? I'm, I'm willing to be the face of this and hire an attorney and say, Michelle wants to do science to save her life. And the federal government is saying that's illegal. And to me, that's such a compelling story. So if that helped move it forward, I would pursue that avenue. But so far, I haven't found a law firm that I think is the right law firm. A very large cannabis firm has offered to represent me, but I feel like this is more like a a constitutional issue. We're not talking about the details of cannabis regulations that growers are dealing with. This is a bigger issue. So I, I'm not sure that they're the right law firm to do it because I don't want... It's a human rights issue. Let's just be honest. It's a human rights yeah. issue. You have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. For you to continue your life and that pursuit of happiness, you should have the liberty to find the medicine that works for you. And right. now that you've found the medicine that works for you, it seems unconstitutional that they are keeping it from you. Yeah. It's a complicated situation because, yeah, there's a lot of issues. So you're looking for a law firm to petition just like a suit of the federal government or? Like so what I was wondering is there's a new law. It's called the right to try law for people who are, have terminal illnesses that gives them sort of more access to other FDA approved treatments that are maybe off label. So it just gives patients a little bit more flexibility and being like, I'm desperate and let's try something else. So because THC is an isolate is legalized as Marinol for severe nausea from surgery and chemo, which I was given in the hospital. So we're just in this crazy, I was given the drug that we say is so bad in the hospital, right? I had to sign a special paper to say I would be given THC. I've never had to sign a special paper for other things, right? So as an example, in my pre-surgery interview with the nurse, I wanted the anesthesiologist to be sure that he knew I had been on high dose THC because some papers coming out of Colorado show there's definitely interactions with anesthesia. Yep. So I said it over and over again. I'm on high dose THC and I want the anesthesiologist to know. And the nurse, I wanted her to know why, right? Like, because there's still this stigma. So I told her that I'd shrunk my tumor and this whole story. And I think, oh gosh, she thinks I'm crazy. And she says, you know, gosh, Michelle, no, my aunt or whoever it was had pancreatic cancer. She lived four times longer than the doctors thought because she was in Colorado. She was using lots of cannabis and she definitely had a very unusual course of her disease. And, and so I'm thinking, you know, I've talked to lots of doctors who know that there's so much goodness trapped in this. What do we have to do? You know, we can't even study it. And here I've got the nurse telling me, oh, she knows. And the anesthesiologist says, oh yeah, he knows. And a friend who was an OBGYN, I mean, I wouldn't even call her a friend, an acquaintance. She donated $1,000 to the film because she knows that gynecological tissue is really driven by the endocannabinoid system. And she's frustrated that there's no science. So I have all these people telling me, yet we're trapped. And it's just, it's madness. It's absolute yeah. madness. I am still curious who you want to sue. What would be the name on the paper? Probably the FDA. As I understand it, the FDA, if they say, no, this molecule is helpful, it's a medicine, they can petition the DEA to say, stop this nonsense and get this out of Schedule 1 and put it in Schedule 4 so that we can study it more easily. And the FDA is not doing it, right? And so I think that my petition would be to use the right to try law or to use the breakthrough therapy law, which says there's you've got something that's looking hopeful for some disease that has no other treatment, and we're going to accelerate it as fast as we can. So breakthrough therapy is like a, a, this fast track that the FDA has approved. Or to say... Michelle has found a PI, a researcher that's Schedule 1 licensed, which I have not been able to find yet because all of that's sort of classified. But if I can find a Schedule 1 researcher, cancer researcher, to say, 
I want to work with Michelle and we're going to do Petri dish studies. And we want this expedited because even if we're talking about in a Petri dish of ovarian cancer cells, if I could find a researcher to hire, I'm going to pay them. These studies aren't that expensive if you're talking preclinical data. And if I can get them to grow the cancer cells, ovarian cancer stem cell lines, and try to find the compounds that are going to work best for me to sort of as an experiment to say, this is the formula Michelle needs, right? And this right. would all be, a, you know, I don't want to say a stunt, but this is like publicity to say, this is what's possible. I know the science we need to do. They're doing it in Israel. Right, Michelle right. wants to try to save her life. If we can find a PI to stand up and say, she's not crazy, let's do this. And the government is stopping it. I mean, if that's a way to break this open, I want to be that person. If it's not the way, then fine. But I feel like so much of this is publicity. We need to change people's minds. So that's basically what it would be. Me finding a researcher who has a Schedule 1 license to say, I want to work with Michelle and we're going to sue because even with a Schedule 1 license, it would take five years to have that done because the paperwork that the FDA and the DEA have made mandatory to work on cannabis, it's like it's plutonium. Wow. Right? The fact that you can go to a dispensary and buy it in the states where it's you know legal at the state level and it, you've just got it in your house, right? If you're a researcher at a university that gets federal funding, you have to have lock special, like basically a purpose built building, a lab, special locks, a huge big safe to keep a tiny stash of cannabis. I mean, it's madness. So that would be the point of that lawsuit is to say, we don't need five years and all of these extra paperwork to get this crappy quality cannabis from the University of Mississippi. And that's the only cannabis that's you know allowed to have science on. And it's not even, you know, Dr. Mieri in, in Israel, they've got greenhouses with different strains. They know exactly which ones. This stuff from Mississippi, it's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic what we're doing. If you read the science that's happening, especially in Israel, you know, it, they're light years away from us. So it's just a crazy idea, the lawsuit. There is a lawsuit um, by some a group of maybe five cannabis activists that a law firm has taken and it's sitting at the steps of the Supreme Court, as I understand it. And I'm sure from what I've read that they won't hear the case because they didn't go through the proper protocol. But the reason they didn't was because it takes so long. So they mm. were saying, this is medicine, it's critical, you need to sort of judge this now. But the, I doubt that the Supreme Court will hear it. I mean, I feel like that case was just, again, to raise publicity right, because the, right. the Supreme Court will throw it back and say, you didn't go through all the proper protocols. So it's just a game. It's a game. And I'm trying to figure out how to use my story, leverage my situation to try to, you know, spark change. Yeah. I'm, I don't know. I'm hopeful that there will be some change coming in response to all the protests that have happened. I mean, don't get me wrong. I don't think legalizing cannabis is going to solve racism or the issues of police brutality. But what I do believe is that we could send a large message to the communities that have been targeted because of this ridiculous charge of drug use and have been mm -hmm. put into this system and cycle of oppression because of it. Absolutely. If we could release these people change those laws on a federal level, mandate that these people, these non-violent drug offenders are freed, eliminate the prison for profit systems and put in some sort of citizen review of police complaints, then, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's that far out of reach to do something that could make a real difference in people's lives. But for some reason, the bullies with badges and in power don't want to move a muscle because yeah. they have the power, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, sorry, I get frustrated. No, no, I am very frustrated too. I mean, yes, as a very white person and a person who grew up in a you know more affluent community, um, I never felt like my life would be so tied to racism. But absolutely, especially after the Black Lives Matter protests, it's like I'm dying because of racism, because this plant has been locked up and incarcerated from science and study because it was tied to brown people. And it's like, you know what? It's all tied together. And it just reminds us that we're all one happy big family. We all need to love each other. If I say it like that, that I'm dying because of racism, you know, it sounds crazy, but it's true. If this medicine had not been pulled out of the pharmacopoeia in 1937, I would not be in this position. Mm -hmm. That first paper that was published in 1975 in Virginia 
that showed cancer cells dying because of cannabis, right? Mm -hmm. The THC in the mouse models, they would have kept doing science. They wouldn't have stopped it. There would be some treatment. So it is all tied together. I really do believe that. And that really hit home more recently because of all these protests. Yeah. It made me realize that we have incarcerated this plant. We have locked up a cure. I use that word, a treatment for cancer, a very manageable treatment for cancer for 80 years Mm -hmm. because we don't like brown people. You know, it's madness. Absolute madness. Yeah. The whole thing is so sad. I really wish that, you know, someone like Ken Burns could put this all together. It deserves the kind of epic American history treatment of, uh, it, you know, this story and Anslinger and all of that deserves a bigger scope. You know, mine is tiny and intentionally very focused, but the story is huge. It really is. Yeah. So we just have to keep telling the story. So I don't know. It would be really nice if they did that instead of another movie where everything blows up. <laughs> I don't know. I was really hoping that cannabis and cancer would be the story of 2020. Yeah, me too. I was hopeful. When Dr. Mieri's paper came out and the data out of Israel, I thought we're finally getting there, right? And I was just devastated when COVID started taking hold. And I thought this is going to push it back another two years. And that just personally for me and my, I mean, I feel like I could die or I could make it. I really don't know if I'm it feels like it could go either way, but COVID, not even getting COVID, but just the research being put on hold and, and everyone being so distracted, it's definitely set us back. And it's it's tragic because I really thought with the election coming up that this was going to be the year we could really talk about medical cannabis and make some progress. So. The more I sit and wait, the more I see more and more people becoming affected with something that can be treated with cannabis. And then when they finally make that step, it's just one more person's eyes opened who get on board and start saying, hey, maybe we should do something about this. But unfortunately, it hasn't hit that tipping point yet to where we see it represented by our politicians. Because like our system or not, that's our system. And you can't tell me that the American people, this was an issue they cared about, that they would vote this issue. I believe that they would. So it just hasn't risen to that uh, level of urgency to them yet. And, And I think it might be a little bit because the powers that be that control the media like to push certain narratives and tuck other ones away and not give those ones the spotlight, not give those ones the microphone. And then they, you know, steer the narrative and steer the populace in the direction they want to go. And it's until something happens in life where everything stops and you're like, oh, my life's just about to be completely over or change in a way I really don't like. I need some treatments. I need some options. Yeah. And that's, the, it, I don't know. It just, it seems I'm, like banging your head against a wall. Yeah. I, the, the, the polling on medical cannabis is actually incredible that it's like 90% approval for medical cannabis. But and those aren't the politicians they vote for. Right, they right, care. exactly. Like, well, there's just some wackadoo that they only care about cannabis and I don't know what they think about these other issues. Right. We, we as voters need to change our thoughts, but. Yeah, but 90%, but you're right. Our politicians haven't caught up yet for sure and it's changing but it needs to for me it needs to you know change faster for a lot of people it does yeah but we're getting there i just uh i try to be hopeful today your treatment how many milligrams are you on a day today i'm on about 40 milligrams a day Uh, my number did inch up a bit uh, my last blood work and i'm trying not to freak out um but because of the pandemic unfortunately and coming to Colorado to spend the summer with my parents and being on different products. Mm. So I upped it a little bit. I was down to about 20 milligrams a day to see if that was enough. Because the goal of medicine is always really take the least amount that, you know, gets what you need. It did inch up a tiny bit. So we'll see. The data coming out of Israel is showing that THC is critical for the apoptosis, which is one of five ways that has been elucidated and described in the scientific literature. But each different type of cancer is driven and, you know, don't even think about sort of point of origin, right? To understand cancer, you have to think about the broken cellular pathways and the mutations that are allowing the cells to keep growing. That's what you think about is like what's broken. And in my case, I have a mutation that's very common in cancer patients called P53. And that mutation means that my cells don't see when a tumor starts to grow. It's called the master of the genome, right? It keeps your genome healthy. And most cancer patients, about half of cancer patients have this mutation. 
all these different mutations that are driving the different types of cancer, each one seems like it needs a slightly different combination of cannabinoids. So it's really complicated. But THC seems really critical for the apoptosis, but then sort of each different type of mutation might need a different helper molecule. So on my recent dosing, you know, maybe I was just missing one of these tiny, maybe beta caryophylline or one of the terpenes that works together. And that's what Dr. Mieri's data is showing is that one strain of cannabis won't do very much for the cancer and another one will do a lot. And that's the sad part about this is it's uh, very heterogeneous and complicated. Did you have strains that worked better for you? So I skipped sort of right over strains and went to the chemistry. Okay. Because the plant can be so diverse, you can take the same genetic plant and grow it indoors and then outdoors and it makes different compounds. So if you're in Ohio and you're buying something and you don't have access from with a lab to get everything tested. I understand why people, you know, so talk about strains, but I, I found that complicated and more confusing. Okay. I've sort of jumped over strains and gone straight to the chemistry. So you look for THC with specific terpene profiles? Yeah. So I get oils compounded and made for me that have, um, so I'm on 40 milligrams of THC and then CBDA and CBD, THCA and CBG. So that's mainly what we try to do is full spectrum and get those ratios. And it's, I mean, it's still a guess. So my dosing physician right now is Dr. Bonnie Goldstein from the movie Weed the People. I met her at the cannabis conference that was, um, that we were at in the film. And I, I knew she was coming and I had planned to ask her if she would help me. And and she, at first she said no, because she didn't realize I was terminal when she saw me. She thought I looked so good. But when I told her my my history. She said, absolutely, I'll help you. But she's still, I mean, I don't want to say she's guessing, but she's just using, you know, the best preclinical data she can. And then she's got several hundred terminal cancer patients and trying to see, you know, who's doing well and who's not and trying to figure it out because we can't do studies. So basically I try to not freak out if it goes up because I know I shrank it once and I just have to really watch it. So what I would say to people If you have a cancer that you're really only monitoring with scans every six months, doing the cannabis is tricky because you don't get that kind of feedback. Hmm. And it's certainly worth trying if you're a terminal patient and you're out of options. But I would just say it's tricky. You have to know what you're doing and try to think like a scientist to try to hopefully have it work for you. It's it's a lot easier if you can have blood work. And so right now I've refused the maintenance therapy, niraparib. It's a PARB inhibitor. And because I my tumors are BRCA negative, it's not very effective. In my tumor type, it only gives an extra three months of progression-free survival, which is nothing. Hmm. I, don't, I want more than three months. Yeah. yeah. So I said no to that treatment. And that's the first time that I have refused treatment, just starting this winter, and said, I know that cannabis will shrink my tumor. I'm going to refuse the niraparib and just do cannabis because we don't know as much about the interactions. And I Mm. felt like the niraparib wasn't enough of an aid that I was willing to put that in the mix. And I thought, I'm just going to try cannabis for a while. If the cannabis stops working, I could try the niraparib. But because I have this blood work, I can see how I'm going. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a really precarious situation to be in. It is. I wish I had more encouraging things to tell you. I mean, I think that it's, (laughs) I don't know. I think you're doing the right thing by not thinking about the strains. The flower in our dispensaries is just THC. I mean, there, Mm -hmm. there might be a little bit of CBD in it. Uh, and or you get really high CBD with a little bit of THC, but I haven't yet to see the product with this diverse of a cannabinoid profile on the market. Right. Yeah. That's why it's, you know special oils that are compounded, and then I yeah we work to to cut them and get the ratios right, and it's a little bit complicated. It is. Yeah. But I believe that one day, I hope sooner than later, we will be able to really have precision cannabinoid oncology medicine pull the molecules apart and only give me the ones that are, you know, effective and get the ratios right. You know, if there's some tiny little minor cannabinoid that's needed to add to the THC that's helping get into that lock and key mechanism and we can figure those ratios out, maybe I'll only need 10 milligrams of THC a day because we'll have everything else just right 
for that THC to do the work it needs to do and we'll get better delivery methods. And, you know, that's what we need the science for. And I see that. And if I said this to another oncologist, they would probably think I'm talking about 50 years in the future if they haven't read all this latest preclinical data. But the miracle of cannabis is that it's safe enough if you're not on other meds and you don't have maybe serious heart issues, because I do get tachycardia sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like at night, if I take 20 milligrams of THC or more, even with the CBD, which can temper it, I can get a rapid heart rate. And at first it was a little bit scary. And there were days when I was like, oh gosh, I feel pretty bad. Sort of as I'm falling asleep and just feeling like I can tell I've taken a lot of medication, but you sleep through it and you wake up and you're just fine. And so, you know. It sounds worse than it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, no one's ever died of an overdose. And I think unless you're really getting into mixing some crazy minor cannabinoids together in really weird ways, if you're using a basic whole flower thing, I have taken 80 milligrams of THC for six months straight and I'm here to tell the tale. And all I did was feel zonked out and tired. So, you know, it's a very flexible medication. And if you go slow and watch it, I think it's very safe, even at higher doses, if you need it, you know, to shrink a tumor. And I've met dozens and dozens of people online who have taken that much and some more. I mean, I never went above 80. I just felt like that was my limit. And my tumor was falling. So I thought I don't need to go above 80. You hear lots of activists saying you have to take a gram a day and blah, blah, blah. No, if you have tumor markers to watch, just take as much as you need for your tumor marker to fall. (laughs) But it's safe enough to try now. If you're in a pickle, Yeah. You know, do it yourself oncology. It sounds mad. And I, when I hear myself say that the doctors in my family, I hear them cringe, but it's like, I have a year to live and the doctor has nothing to offer me. So I'm going to try it. Well, I think you've got more than that left in you personally. I think, (laughs) I, I hope so. Michelle, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Is there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners who are considering cannabis? We have all been misled and lied to. At the turn of the last century, in 1900, 1910, and 1920, 30% of all medicine prescribed in the United States was cannabis. Doctors had it in every little medical bag in their horse and buggies traveling across this country. And taking this out of the pharmacopoeia was a political act. It was not a healthcare act. The American Medical Association lobbied against taking cannabis out of the pharmacopoeia. You can find that documentation at the Library of Congress. So look at the science. It's complicated. It's not a magic cure-all pill, but we have this system in our bodies and this plant happens to hit all those targets and it is absolutely medicine. And we have to think of it as a medicine that just sort of as an aside can make you a little bit giggly and happy, right? It's absolutely medicine. And that's my message. You know, I cannot believe that I'm here two years later after the first time I've tried cannabis, but it shrinks tumors. It helps kids with epilepsy. And I know that, you know, there's so many studies. So that's my final word. Consider cannabis. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thanks, Curtis. Go now to www.scheduleonemovie.com and watch your story. And this November, consider voting for pro-cannabis officials to take office. It could be what keeps your tumor markers down. Once again, that's www.schedule1movie.com. If you would like to be a guest and share how cannabis has impacted your health and wellness, send an email to considercannabisnow at gmail.com. You can also reach us at our website, considercannabisnow.com, where you can find all our previous episodes, as well as links you can follow to our Instagram, Facebook page, and more. If you have found anything of value on this show, please share it with someone else. Remember to subscribe for free and get every new episode delivered right to your phone. Thank you for listening. Join us next time as we consider cannabis together.